Good after morning. Today I'm going to discuss a fraught topic and I can't do it without the help of my Minnie Mouse and the coffee that she prefers. And the topic is, is COVID-19 nature's revenge? <clears throat> is it nature's way of getting back at us? Is it nature's way of calibrating, of culling us, of making sure that the damage that we inflict upon the environment ceases? Did all other species conspire against us in a concilium to which we were not invited and came up with a virus? Nature is presented as some kind of cunning conspiracy theorist out to get us. Is it all true? And more importantly, is there such a thing as nature to start with? These are all deep philosophical questions. I'll try to simplify them for you. The video will, uh, contains some parts, small parts, which are deep, philosophical, physics, and so on. Skip. They're not critical. Just skip to the next part. And it contains parts which are more, much more accessible. I'm sorry, I had to mix the two to make sense uh, of the whole presentation. So now, let's tackle these fraught questions. Around 55% of the world's population live in urban areas, and that number probably will increase to 68% by 2050. And it is urbanization that is a ma major driver of biodiversity loss. So today, town planners all over the world are trying to incorporate nature, like a nature reserve, like the Native Americans, incorporate nature in, in cities. And so we have like cities with green spaces and this kind of thing even cities with uh, open zoos in, in the middle. And there's a UN agreement, United Nations agreement, called the Paris Agreement for Nature, which includes provisions for to reverse biodiversity loss. The COVID-19 pandemic is a pandemic of cities. It's, it's very rare in the countryside. It's a pandemic of cities, and it's a pandem pandemic of the rich world. It's much more rare in places like Africa, and big parts of Asia. The outbreak has seen cities and towns go into lockdown. And so because of that, wildlife took over, reclaimed what used to be nature. So we see like wild boar, deer, monkeys, foxes, even lions, venture into territory previously dominated by humans. And so we, we can gaze out the window and see an elephant waving his trunk or a giraffe eating our potted plants. Professors Joseph Settele, Sandra Diaz, and Eduardo Buondizio, they came up with a cumbersomely titled report in 2019. It's, it was published by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. The titles of these reports are, worse on, are even worse than the names of the scientists involved. I don't know why these people, uh, probably something to do with arcane access. At any rate, the report concluded that human society was in jeopardy from the accelerating decline of the Earth's natural life support system. And the experts say in this report, the coronavirus pandemic is likely to be followed by even more deadly and destructive disease outbreaks, unless their root cause, the rampant destruction of the natural world, is rapidly halted, halted. They published, of course, this after the pandemic started. And they're saying there is a single species responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is us. Recent pandemics are a direct consequence of human activity, particularly our global financial and economic systems that prize economic growth at any cost. We have a small window of opportunity in overcoming the challenges of the current crisis to avoid sowing the seeds of future ones. Typical alarmist language. Is it all true? Are we at war with nature? <clears throat> Let's reverse a bit. There is a field in physics called thermodynamics, and there's a law in thermodynamics called the second law of thermodynamics. It predicts the gradual energetic de decay, decline of physical closed systems. This gradual energetic decay is called entropy. Arguably, the universe as a whole 
is precisely such a system, a closed system. So the whole universe is falling apart, decaying, entropy. But locally, order is, is often fighting disorder for dominance. In other words, when we have a localized system which is open, order sometimes tends to increase. And by definition, statistical entropy tends to decrease. Stay with me. Don't, don't shut off the video. It gets much better a bit in a bit. But I must go through these considerations in order to get to the point. I believe that some physical systems increase disorder, either by decaying or by actively spreading disorder onto other systems. And we call such vectors entropic agents. And there are other physical systems that increase order or decrease disorder, either in themselves or in their environment, and we call these vectors negentropic agents. So we have entropic agents, they increase chaos, they increase disorder, and we have negentropic agents, which increase order. Human beings are and always have been negentropic agents. Look around you. We have buildings, we have roads, we have smartphones, we have mini mouse cups. We increase order. But something has happened. We have gone awry. We went out of control. Now, through our excesses, mankind is slowly being transformed from a negentropic positive agent, agent that increases order, into an entropic agent, agent that increases chaos, disorder, disintegration. Our nature, so to speak, has changed. We became a malevolent entity. Antibiotics, herbicides, insecticides, pollution, deforestation, acid rain, global warming, etc., etc. They are all detrimental to the environment and reduce the amount of order in the open system that we call Earth, this spaceship, the, the only one that we have. And nature must balance this shift of allegiance, this deviation from equilibrium. And the only way nature can do this is either by reducing other entropic agents on Earth or by reducing our numbers, by reducing the numbers of humans. Then there's no third way. And to achieve the latter, to achieve the reduction in the number of humans, which is the path of least resistance and a typical self-regulatory mechanism, to achieve this, nature causes humans to begin to internalize and assimilate the entropy, the mess that they themselves uh, are generating. In 1983, I published a paper, later I, I placed it online in 1997, and I suggested that nature uses three intricate and intertwined mechanisms to achieve the reduction in the numbers of humans. The first one is the Malthusian mechanism, after the scholar Malthus, the economist Malthus. The Malthusian mechanism simply means that limited resources lead to wars, famine, diseases, and to a decrease in the population, and thus to the number of human and tropic agents. Then there is the assimilative mechanism. Diseases, old and new, and other phenomena, yield negative demographic effects directly related to the entropic actions of humans. Examples, excessive use, use of antibiotics leads to drug-resistant strains of pathogens such as MRSA. Cancer and deteriorating sperm counts are caused by human pollution. We assimilate our own pollution, thereby reducing our numbers. Heart ailments, heart diseases are related to the modern Western diet. AIDS, avian flu, SARS, swine flu, COVID-19, these, all these diseases are, a, are results of hitherto unknown or mutated strains of viruses. Latter-day technologies such as telecommunication, transportation, social media, internet, and so on, these cause massive dislocations and anomies which lead to precipitous declines in the number of children. Sexless marriages, atomization of societies, increasing adultery, casual sex, alienation, malignant individualism, narcissism, and rise in psychopathic behaviors. All these conspire, conspire against stable families, which are the only institution, uh, it's the only institution that we have come up with to raise children. So it reduces the number of children. Technology has displaced warfare and famines as the main engine of decline and decadence of our civilization. Technology, we invented it, and now we are consuming it and it's poisoning us. And then there's the cognitive mechanism. Humans limit their own propagation using rational, 
cognitive arguments, devices, procedures. So there's abortion, there's birth control, the pill, there's getting married and procreating later or not at all, there's family planning. We ourselves are limiting our own numbers, the population bomb. And so if you combine these three mechanisms, the Malthusian, the assimilative and the cognitive, Nature controls the damage and disorder that mankind spreads. Nature restores equilibrium to the terrestrial ecosystem. It sometimes sounds like nature has a mind of its own, of its own, like it's a thinking thing. And indeed, there's the Gaia hypothesis that actually Earth is a kind of organism. But of course, this is anthropomorphizing nature. It's attributing to nature human traits and qualities. Nature is nature is nature. It's an automatic system. It's self-regulating. If we damage nature, nature will dam damage us back. No question about this. So this part, I fully agree with environmentalists. But the very concept of nature is very controversial. Only, only 200 years ago, people hated nature. And I'm quoting from, from an article written by Stephen Budiansky. And the article is titled Nature, A Bit Overdone, U.S. News and World Report, December 2nd, uh, 1996. And in this article, Budiansky says, it wasn't just predictable curmudgeons like Dr. Dr. Johnson, who thought the Scottish hills ugly. If anybody had something to say about mountains at all, it was sure to be an insult. People, for example, called the Alps monstrous excrescences, excrescences of nature. In the, words, in the words of one wholly typical 18th century observer, people hated nature, people feared nature, people wanted to destroy nature in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. So where did the concept of nature come from? And why do we love nature suddenly? What has happened? Concept of nature is a romantic invention. It was spun by the likes of Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century as a confabulated utopian contrast to, to the dystopia of urbanization and Darwinian ruthless materialism. The traces of this dewy-eyed conception of the savage, the wild man's alleged harmony and resonance with nature, the primitive man's unmolested, unadulterated surroundings, this, this whole can be found in the more malignant forms of fundamentalist and environmentalism in pop culture. So you have a movie like Avatar, a cinematic extravaganza, which is essentially propaganda. It shows how primitive men get along with nature and how nature enables and empowers them. That's not true. That's not true. Men, mankind has always been nature's worst enemy and nature has always conspired to kill as many humans as it could. We overcame our environment. We didn't collaborate with it. We destroyed it for good reason. At the other extreme are religious literalists, and they regard man as the crown of creation with complete dominion over nature and the right to exploit nature's resources unreservedly. And so similar veiled sentiments can be found among many, many scientists. Scientists regard nature as something to be manhandled, raped. And you have something like uh, an example in, in the anthropic principle. It's promoted by many outstanding physicists. And the anthropic principle claims, it's a religious principle in my view, it claims that the nature of the universe is preordained to accommodate sentient beings. And guess who these sentient beings are? Yes, no prize goes to anyone. So these sentient beings are us, humans. Nature has been altered to accommodate us. Industrialists, politicians and economists have only recently begun to pay lip service to sustainable development and to the environmental cost of their policies. And thus, in a way, these people bridge the abyss at least verbally, between the two diametrically opposed forms of fundamentalism, environmentalism and religion. Similarly, the denizens of the West continue to indulge in rampant consumption, but now it is suffused with environmental guilt rather than driven by unadulterated, unadulterated hedonism. Even, but even if we look at, let's say, religion versus environmentalism, uh, nature is men's servant or nature is man's master. Despite these essential dissimilarities, there's, in both of them, there's a dualism, men and nature. And this dualism is universally acknowledged. 
it was modern physics it's it is modern physics that is trying to eliminate this this cartesian artificial distinction between men and nature modern physics notably the copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics has abandoned the classic split between a typically human observer and a usually inanimate observed environmentalists in contrast have embraced this discarded worldview wholeheartedly when you talk to environmentalists man is the active agent operating upon a distinct reactive or passive substrate known as nature <clears throat> but it's intuitively compelling because we have self-awareness we have introspection we feel that we feel that we are distinct from each other and of course from nature but it's a false dichotomy it's a false dichotomy because man by definition is a part of nature his tools are natural there's nothing more natural than the smartphone his constructions are natural the built environment buildings bridges there are numerous species in nature which construct buildings termites construct high rises um, beavers construct bridges man interacts with the other elements of nature yes true modifies the other elements of nature true ecosystems all true but all other species are doing the same arguably bacteria and insects exert on nature far more influence than men far, they have far further reaching consequences than man has ever done has ever had even an environmentalist like bill mckibben um, of end of nature fame they recognize this synergetic confluence there is there are two versions to think like a mountain aldo leopold and the challenge is, is to think like a shopping mall stephen vogel because shopping malls are natural we should consider the entirety of our surrounding argues stephen vogel we should seek to optimize our environment regardless of its origin man-made or natural is an artificial distinction not true still the law of the minimum that there is a limit to human population growth and that this barrier is related to the biotic and abiotic variables of the environment this law is undisputed whatever debate there is veers between two strands of this malthusian weltanschau there is a utilitarian strand anthropocentric shallow technocratic technocentric and there's the ethical strand uh, biocentric deep or ecocentric let's review these two strands of thinking first the utilitarians economists for instance tend to discuss the costs and benefits of environmental policies activists on the other hand demand that mankind consider the rights of other beings for example animals and the rights of nature as a whole in determining at least the least harmful cause of action utilitarians regard nature as a set of exhaustible and scarce resources and deal with their optimal allocation from a human point of view yet utilitarians usually fail to incorporate intangibles such as the beauty of the of a sunset or the liberating sensation of open spaces utilitarians should go out more often green accounting adjusting the national accounts to reflect environmental data is still in its unpromising infancy it is complicated by the fact that ecosystems do not respect man-made borders and by the stubborn refusal of many ecological variables to succumb to numbers to complicate things further different nations weigh environmental problems very very disparately despite recent attempts such as the environmental sustainability index esi produced by the world economic forum wef no one knows how to define and quantify elusive concepts such as sustainable development even the cost of replacing or repairing depleted resources and natural assets even these costs which are supposedly in terms of money they're difficult to determine efforts to capture quality of life considerations in the straitjacket of the formalism of distributive justice um, these efforts have backfired it's known as the human welfare ecology or emancipatory emancipatory environmentalism these schools they, they didn't work out they backfired they led to derisory attempts ridiculous attempts to reverse the inex inexorable processes of urbanization and industrialization by introducing localized small-scale production it's pathetic social ecologists prefer the same prescriptions but with an anarchist uh, twist the hierarchical view of nature with men at the pinnacle is a reflection of social relations they suggest dismantle social relations and you get rid 
of the war with nature. Ethicists appear to be as confounded and ludicrous as their feet on the ground opponents. Biocentrists view nature as possessed of an intrinsic value regarding of its actual or potential utility. They say nature in itself is a value, never mind if we can use it or not. But they fail to specify how this, even if true, gives rise to rights or uh, rights of nature or, for example, commensurate obligations. Why, if nature has a value, intrinsic value, does it oblige me to do anything or to refrain from doing anything? And their case is not aided by their association with the apocalyptic or survivalist schools of environmentalism, which have developed proto-fascist tendencies, and they're totally scientifically debunked. The proponents of deep ecology radicalize the ideas of social ecology ad absurdum and postulate a transcendentalist spiritual connection with the inanimate, with nature, whatever that may be. In consequence, these people refuse to intervene to counter or to contain natural processes, including pandemics and famine. That's how far we've got. The politicization of environmental concerns runs a gamut from political activism to eco-terrorism. The environmental movement, whether in academia, in the media, non-governmental organization, legislature, even in government itself, the whole movement is now comprised of a web of bureaucratic interest groups. And like all bureaucracies, environmental organizations are out to perpetuate themselves to make money, to fight heresy and accumulate political clout and the capital and perks that come with political clout. They have become political movements. They are, they are no longer a disinterested and objective party. They have a stake in the apocalypse. That makes them automatically suspect in my book. A few years ago, there was a guy called Bjorn Lombok, and he wrote The Skeptical Environmentalist, and he was at the receiving end of such self-serving sanctimony. He was attacked. The guy is a statistician. He demonstrated that the doom and gloom tended by environmental campaigners, by scholars and militants, these doom and gloom are at best dubious and at worst the outcomes of deliberate manipulation of numbers. The situation is actually improving on many fronts, showed Lombok. Known reserves of fossil fuels and most metals are actually rising, not being depleted. Agricultural production per head is surging. The number of the famished is declining, not going up. Biodiversity loss is slowing. Pollution is slowing. Tropical deforestation is slowing. Yes, believe it or not, despite Bolsonaro in Brazil. In the long run, even in pockets of environmental degradation in the poor and developing countries, rising incomes and the attendant drop in birth rates will likely ameliorate the situation in the long run, said Lombard. And yet both camps, the optimists and the pessimists, shall I say, the perennial pessimist, or the professional pessimist, or the self-interested pessimist. They both rely on partial, irrelevant, or worse, manipulated data. The multiple authors of People and Ecosystems, published by the World Resources Institute, the World Bank, and the United Nations, they themselves conclude, our knowledge of ecosystems has increased dramatically, but it simply has not kept pace with our ability to alter these ecosystems. Quoted by The Economist, Daniel Estai of Yale, the leader of an environmental project sponsored by the World Economic Forum, he says, why hasn't anyone done careful environmental measurement before? Businessmen always say what matters get measured. Social scientists started quantitative measurement only 30 years ago, and even political science turned to hard numbers only 15, year, 15 years ago. Yet look at the environmental policy and the data a lousy. Nor is this dearth of reliable and unequivocal information likely to end anytime soon. Even the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, supported by numerous development agencies, environmental groups, you name it, it's seriously underfunded, underfinanced. The conspiracy minded attribute this curious underfunding to the self serving designs of the apoc apocalyptic school of environmentalism. In ignorance and fear, they point out are among the fanatics' most useful allies. They also make for good copy, of course. I, I like to illustrate my points with movies. So, in, there, were two, there were two movies. Uh, Kingsman, The Secret Service, 2014, and the action thriller Inferno by Dan Brown. In both movies, deranged billionaires seek to cull or sterilize the human race. 
Today, conspiracy theorists say that Bill Gates is planning to do this. And these billionaires want to cull or limit the growth in the numbers of in the numbers of humans as a way to avoid an ineluctable and disastrous showdown with the planet Earth, egregiously abused by us. Their reprehensible methods aside, their diagnosis and prognosis are presented as ominously correct. Their intentions as pure to ascertain and safeguard, safeguard the survival of our species. So the movie says they are right about the prognosis, they are right that we should stop, but they are wrong on how to do it. But the abstract concept of species is at best a mere organizing principle, a taxonomic artifact. It's like a I don't know, nation, state. It serves to point at commonalities shared by individuals. But nation and state can claim an even higher standing because in contradistinction to species, they have some utility. They reify fruitful functionalities. Individuals subsume themselves in nation states because doing so enhances their chances at longevity and welfare and guarantees a hospitable, hospitable environment for procreation and wealth accumulation. What are the benefits of species? What benefits does, species, does the concept of species confer on any of us? Why do we have to use it? From an individual's point of view, while it would make sense to sacrifice human lives in order to preserve certain collectives, to sacrifice human lives in order to propagate the human species is nonsensical, because there's no such thing. But is it as inane when seen from the point of view of mankind as a biological whole? Yes, it is. There is no such thing as the standpoint of the nation <clears throat> or the perspective of the species. Collectives don't have worldviews. They don't have priorities. Only the individuals that comprise collectives do. The aggregate of individual choices and decisions is not an emergent phenomenon independent of its individual roots. Statistics should never be confused with reality, with ontology. So how, how should we adapt to, for example, phenomenon like rapid climate change to minimize severe upheaval? Even this question makes two explicit assumptions, both of which are controversial and disputed. First of all, that climate, climate change is rapid. Second, that it would result in severe upheaval. Similarly, it is not clear whether the best reaction to global warming should be societal or individual or perhaps global. That global warming is happening has now been established. Only idiots would deny that. Yes, such a forcing is likely to take centuries to induce any discernible climate change on the planetary level. Moreover, self-interested and well-paying hyper side, we know close to nothing about the hyper-complex set of interactions between various greenhouse gases, the atmosphere, oceans, Earth's orbit, ice sheets, volcanic eruptions, human activities, and unforeseen outcomes, byproducts of well-meaning regulation, technologies, biofuels, social, solar dynamics, plate tectonics, thousands of other factors. Thousands of factors, the vast majority of which have yet to be discovered. We know nothing. We know nothing. It's hubris, hubris and vanity to make claims about the planetary system as it is hubris and vanity to make claims about the brain. We are very, very grandiose. Environmentalism is therefore poor science or pseudoscience. It is a pernicious and venal form of faddish hubris. In our current state of, of ignorance, not knowledge, the more ambitious variants of solutions, such as geo, geoengineering, are far more dangerous than the threats of global warming. Only two things are clear. A. Climate change had happened frequently and repeatedly, long before and ever since humans strode the scene. B. Some regions of Earth will greatly benefit economically from global warming. Others will be damaged. Others, inevitably, will suffer and will have to adapt. None of this sounds like a severe upheaval, let alone life-threatening, as a more rabid and sensationalist environment, environmentalist will have us believe. We should take an inventory of what we know. We should act upon this inventory resolutely. Mitigation. We should mitigate. Emissions from fuel fu um, fossil fuel combustion should be tamed, captured, stored, sunk, sequestered. Aerosols should be further studied in conjunction with global dimming and ozone, ozone depletion. Measures of, for population control and family planning should be enhanced. Alternative and re renewable fuels should be studied. Incentives should be provided to energy efficient, clean, green technologies. Cement manufacture should be tweaked. Cap and trade or tax schemes implemented on the national, corporate, individual levels. 
weather resistance, energy conserving, green construction technologies, pioneered, diets of livestock should be adapted to restrict biological emissions, deforestation, reforestation should be rationalized, as should be land use, drought-related indigenous agricultural and water management knowledge, crop varieties, they should all be preserved, flood defenses erected, strengthened, weather monitoring capacity should be extended and modernized. These measures make good sense. They're indisputable. Whatever the urgency of the problem facing us, why not implement them? Why do we need to go into panic? Panic mode, like in, in COVID-19. We are recently, in the past few decades, acting out of panic. We are, we've become a panicky species, if species exist, or panicky race. Panic, anxiety, depression now affect a whopping 20% of the human population. Fact, clinical fact. But we should invest the bulk of our scarce resources in research, in innovation. We should accept that climate change is inevitable and work out ways of harnessing it to our benefit. We should come up with new agricultural methods and strains, new types of tourism, new irrigation techniques, water desalination, diversion, water transport and allocation schemes, ways of sustaining biological diversity, of helping the human body adapt, cope, global plans to cope with energy production problems, poverty, disease, triggered by global warming. Global warming is, is here to stay. Let's, you know, let's get over, get over it, get used to it. For the next few centuries, global warming is inexorable, largely irreversible. As the IPCC, by the way, essentially admits, to think otherwise is completely delusional. Better to reimagine our existence on this planet, better to adapt. As temperatures rise in certain locales and drop in others, by the way, new economic activities, routes of commerce should be made possible or rendered feasible. Maybe, I don't know, sunbathing tourism in Sweden. New types of produce, new types of forests will flourish. New technologies will be developed to cater to a novel and growing sets of needs. It's an opportunity. Every crisis is an opportunity. We would do well to not consider global warming as a crisis, but as a massive change. And even if we insist on regarding it as a cataclysm, as the Chinese saying goes, there are opportunities in every predicament. By the way, they don't say this. It's a Western invention. The initial costs of every transformation and transition in human history have been steep. Do you remember the Industrial Revolution? Uh, those of you my age, do you remember the Industrial Revolution? Do you remember the transition from communism to capitalism? Every change has a price. Climate change is not likely to be the only exception. Such a massive realignment implies severe disruption, great distress, all true. But invariably, tectonic shifts are, are followed by an extended period of creativity and growth. This time will be no different. So, okay, you say, but what about pandemics? What about disease? What about COVID-19? What about this? What about that? We are all terminally ill. It's a matter of time before we all die. Aging and death remain almost as mysterious as ever. We feel awed and uncomfortable when we contemplate these twin afflictions. They are afflictions, they are diseases. Indeed, the very word, this is, denotes, uh, denoting illness, it, it contains its best definition. This is, a mental component of lack of well-being must exist subjectively. The person must feel that, must experience discomfiture for his condition to qualify as a disease. And to this extent, we are justified in class classifying all diseases as kind of spiritual or mental. But is there any other way of distinguishing health from sickness? A way that does not depend on the report that the patient provides regarding his subjective or her subjective experience? Well, obviously, I'm not, I'm not deluded and I'm not, I'm, I, this is coffee, not vodka. So I'm still lucid. Some diseases are manifest. Others are latent or imminent. I know this. Genetic diseases, for example, can exist unmanifested for generations. And this raises the philosophical problem of whether a potential disease is a disease. AIDS and hemophilia carriers, which are asymptomatic, are they sick? Should they be treated, ethically speaking? They experience no disease. They report no symptoms. No signs are evident. On what moral grounds can we commit these people to treatment or even to social distancing? If I'm I have COVID-19 and I'm asymptomatic, what are the moral ethical grounds to limit my movement? Of course, the immediate answer, 
on the grounds of the greater good, the greater benefit. Carriers threaten others, must be isolated or otherwise neutered. The threat inherent in carriers must be eradicated. But this is a very dangerous moral precedent. All kinds of people threaten our well-being. Unsettling ideologies, mentally handicapped, psychopaths, narcissists, and the vast majority of politicians. Why should we single out our physical well-being as worthy of a privileged moral status? Why is our mental well-being, for example, for example, less important? Why don't we, I don't know, socially distant psychopaths forever? Moreover, the distinction between the psychic and the physical is hotly disputed philosophically. The psychophysical problem is as, as intractable today as it ever was, if not more so. It is beyond doubt that the physical affects the mental and the mental affects the physical. This is what disciplines like psychiatry are all about. The ability to control autonomous body functions, even heartbeat, even blood pressure, and mental reactions to pathogens of the brain are proof of the artificialness of this distinction. It is a result of the reductionist view of nature as divisible and summable. The sum of the parts, alas, is not always the whole, and there is no such thing as an infinite set of the rules of nature, only an asymptotic approximation of it. The distinction between the patient and the outside world is superfluous and wrong. The patient and his environment are one and the same. Disease is a perturbation in the operation and management of the complex ecosystem known as patient world. Humans absorb their environment. They feed it in equal measures. This ongoing interaction is the patient. We cannot exist without the intake of water, air, visual stimuli, and food, and viruses. Our environment is defined by our actions and by our own output, physical and mental. Thus, one must question the classical differentiation, classical distinction between internal and external. Some illnesses are considered endogenic, generated from the inside. Natural internal causes, a heart defect, biochemical imbalance, genetic mutation, metabolic process, they've gone awry, they cause disease. Aging, deformities also belong in this category. In contrast, problems of naturance and environment, early childhood abuse, for instance, malnutrition, they're external. And so are classical pathogens, such as germs or viruses and accidents. But this again is a counterproductive approach. Exogenic and endogenic pathogenesis, pathogenesis is inseparable. Mental states, for example, increase or decrease the, our susceptibility to externally induced disease. Talk therapy or abuse, external events, alter the biochemical balance of the brain. The inside constantly interacts with the outside and is so intertwined with the outside that all distinctions, distinctions between inside and outside are artificial and worse, misleading. The best example is, of course, medication. It is an external agent. It influences internal processes, and it has a very strong mental correlate. Its efficacy is influenced by mental factors. The placebo effect, the nocebo effect. We give people water, they, they heal, they get cured. The very nature of dysfunction and sickness is highly culture dependent. Societal parameters dictate right and wrong in health, especially mental health. It is all a matter of statistics. Certain diseases are accepted in certain parts of the world as a fact of life or even a sign of distinction. For example, the paranoid schizophrenic in the past used to be thought of as chosen by the gods. If there is no disease, there is no disease. Disease. That the physical or mental state of a person can be different does not imply that it must be different, or even that it is desirable that it should be different. In an overpopulated world, sterility might be the desirable thing, or even the occasional pandemic, but there is no such thing as absolute dysfunction. The body and the mind always function. They adapt themselves to their environment, and if the environment changes, they change. Personality disorders are the best possible responses to abuse, for example. They are positive adaptations. Cancer may be the best possible response to carcinogens, and a part of evolution, because it encourages mutations. Aging and death are definitely the best possible response to overpopulation. Pandemics are the best possible response for population control and culling. Perhaps the point of view of the single patient is incommensurate with the point of view of his species, but this should not serve to obscure the issues or derail rational debate. For example, in COVID-19, most patients who died died in nursing homes, 
And in Italy, more than 95% were above the age of 70, 56% above the age of 81. It's, it's painful to the families, but is it bad? As a result, it is logical to introduce the notion of positive aberration. Certain hyper or hypofunctioning can yield positive results and prove to be adaptive. The difference between positive and negative aberrations can never be objective. Nature is normally is morally neutral, embodies no values, no preferences. It simply exists. We humans introduce our value systems, our prejudices, prejudices, our priorities into our activities, including science. It is better to be healthy, we say, because we feel better when we are healthy. Really? Circularity aside, this is the only criterion that we can reasonably employ. If the patient feels good, it is not a disease, even if we all think it is. If the patient feels bad, he could be stony, unable to function, it is a disease, even when we all think that it is not. Needless to say that I am referring to the mythical creature, the fully informed patient. If someone is sick and knows no better, has never been healthy, then his decision should be respected only after he is given the chance to experience health. All the attempts to introduce objective yardsticks of health are plagued and philosophically contaminated by the insertion of values, preferences and priorities into the formula, or by subjecting the formula to these values altogether. One such attempt is to define health as an increase in order or efficiency of processes, as contrasted with illness, which is a decrease in order, increase in entropy, and in the efficiency of processes, while being factually disputable. Some, di some diseases increase order and actually create new functions. So it's factually disputable. But this, <laughs> this dichotomy suffers from a series of implicit value judgments. For instance, why should we prefer life over death? Why should we prefer order to chaos, efficiency to inefficiency? Health and sickness are different states of affairs. Whether one is preferable to the other is a matter of the specific culture and society in which the question is posed. Health and its lack they are determined by employing three filters, as it were. One, is the body affected? Two, is the person affected? This is the bridge between physical and mental illnesses. Three, is society affected? In the case of mental health, the third question is often formulated as, is it normal? Is it statistically the norm of this particular society in the particular time? We must rehumanize disease. By imposing upon issues of health the pretensions of the accurate sciences, we have objectified the patient and the healer, patient and the healer alike, and we have utterly neglected that which cannot be quantified or measured, the human spirit, the human mind. Recent studies in animal sexuality are an example of such an approach, such thinking. They serve to dispel two common myths, that sex is exclusively about reproduction and that homosexuality is an unnatural sexual preference. These are examples of the imposition of values on medicine, on psychology and psychiatry, because homosexuality used to be a mental health diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual until 1973. It now appears that sex is also about rec recreation, as it frequently occurs out of the mating season in animals. Same-sex copulation and bonding are common in hundreds of species, from bonobo apes to gulls. Moreover, Homosexual couples in the animal kingdom are prone to behaviors commonly and erroneously attributed only to heterosexuals. The New York Times reported in its February 7, 2004 issue about a couple of gay penguins who are desperately and recurrently seeking to incubate eggs together. In the same article, titled Love That Dare Not Speak Its Name, Bruce Bagemill, Ed, uh, author of the groundbreaking biological exuberance, animal homosexuality and natural diversity, he defines homosexuality as any of these behaviors between members of the same sex, long-term bonding, sexual contact, courtship displays, or the rearing of the young, raising children. Still, that a certain behavior occurs in nature is natural, does not render it moral. Infanticide, patricide, suicide, gender bias, and substance abuse, they are all to be found in various animal species. It is futile to argue for homosexuality or against it based on zoological observations. Ethics is about surpassing nature, not about emulating it. The more perplexing question remains, what are the evolutionary and biological advantages of recreational sex, of homosexuality? Surely both entail the waste of scarce resources. 
Convoluted explanations, such as the one preferred by Marlene Zuck, homosexuals contribute to the gene pool by nurturing and raising young relatives, she says. Marlene Zuck. These explanations defy common sense, experience, and the calculus of evolution. There are no field studies that show conclusively or even indicate that homosexuals tend to raise and nurture their young relatives uh, more than straight, straight guys do, or girls. The arithmetic of genetics would rule out such a stratagem. If the aim of life is to pass on one's genes from one generation to the next, the homosexual would have been far better off raising his own children, who carry forward half his DNA, rather than his nephew or niece, with whom he shares merely one quarter of his genetic material. What is more, though genetically predisposed, homosexuality may be partly acquired, the outcome of environment and nurture, rather than nature. An oft overlooked fact is that recreational sex and homosexuality have one thing in common. They do not lead to reproduction. Homosexuality may therefore be a form of pleasurable sexual play. It may also enhance same-sex bonding and train the young to form cohesive, purposeful groups. For example, the army or boarding school. And homosexuality amounts to the culling of 10 to 15 percent of the gene pool in each generation. The genetic material of the homosexual is not propagated and is effectively excluded from the big roulette of life. Growers of anything from cereals to cattle similarly use random culling to improve their stock. As mathematical models show, such repeated mass removal of DNA from the common brew seems to optimize the species and to increase its resilience and efficiency. So it is ironic to realize that homosexuality and other forms of non-reproductive pleasure-seeking sex may be key evolutionary mechanisms and integral drivers of population dynamics. Re reproduction is but one goal among many equally important end results. Heterosexuality is but one strategy among a few optimal solutions. Studying biology may yet lead to greater tolerance for the vast repertory of human sexual foible foibles, preferences, predilections, proclivities. Back to nature in this case may be forward to civilization. And so, I think the message is live and let live. That is nature's message. Epigenetics aside, both the now discarded strong forms of Lamarckism, the inheritance of all acquired characteristics as a sole vehicle of evolution, and evolution theory, both of them postulate that function determines form. Natural selection rewards those forms best suited to carry out the function of survival. It's called survival of the fittest in each and every habitat through the mechanism of adaptive radiation. But whose survival is natural selection concerned with? Is it the survival of the individual, of the species, of the or the habitat, of the ecosystem? These three, individual, species, habitat, are not necessarily compatible or mutually reinforcing in their goals and actions. If we set aside the dewy-eyed arguments of altruism, we are compelled to accept that individual survival sometimes threatens and endangers the survival of the species. For instance, if the individual is sick, or weak, or evil, the species is threatened. Typhoid Mary. As every environmental scientist can attest, the thriving of some species puts at risk the existence of whole habitats and ecological niches, and leads other species to extin extinction, for example, invasive species. To prevent the potential excesses of egotistic self-propagation, survival is self-limiting, self-regulating. Consider again pandemics. Rather than go on forever, they abate after a certain number of hosts have been infected. It is a kind of Nash equilibrium, self-limitation. Macroevolution, the coordinated emergence of entire groups of organisms, trumps microevolution, the selective dynamics, species, races, and subspecies. This delicate and self-correcting balance between the needs and pressures of competing populations is manifest even in the single organism of spe or species. Different parts of the phenotype invariably develop at different rates, thus preventing an all-out scramble for resources and maladaptive changes. And this is known as mosaic evolution. It is reminiscent of the invisible hand of the market that allegedly allocates resources optimally among various players and agents. Martin Nowak, a Harvard professor, argues that emergent cooperation is a fundamental principle of evolution as basic as natural selection, as mutation. Moreover, evolution favors organisms whose rate of reproduction is such 
that their populations expand to no more than the number of individuals that the habitat can support, the habitat's carrying capacity. And these are called case selection species or case strategies. They are considered the poster children, poster children of adaptation. Live and let live is what evolution is all about, not the law of the jungle. The survival of all the species that are fit to survive is preferred to the hegemony of a few rapacious, highly adapted, belligerent predators. Nature is about compromise, not about conquest. It's a lesson that COVID-19 is trying to remind us of. And never mind how many of us died in this pandemic, it's a lesson well worth the price.